Hi everyone, it's Mary Long with My Art Dish, and today I'm very pleased to bring you uh, an artist and a plein air event uh, planner coordinator uh, founder, uh, Karen Menigan. Hi, Karen. Hey, Mary. How are you? I'm really good. It's so nice to see you, and uh, this is a um, a uh, recording, uh, an interview that's coming from the Zane Gray Museum. And so we'll get to see a little bit of that. And we're going to talk about the Zane Gray plein air event on the Delaware uh, that uh, Karen has founded and is very excited about. Uh, we And I'm very excited for her to be bringing that to life. And so I thought we'd just chat with uh, Karen today and hear about her as an artist and uh, also about the event. So Karen, just, just catch us up and tell us about your background and, and uh, what brought you to plein air and events. Hey, um, well, I would say um, what brought me to plein air might be surprising um, and unrelated to art. Uh, actually, I was doing a lot of adventure hiking mm -hmm. in Central and South America. Um, and I discovered that um, there were a lot of times when I wanted to stop and sketch. And I was with a group. We needed to keep with an itinerary, move swiftly. Um, and... I couldn't do it. So regrettably, I, I had to kind of give that up. And I said, okay, I really need to be, find myself another group that does want to linger, that does want to be adventurous um, and explore, you know, often rugged terrain. And so I segued um, into plein air um, because of that. The other reason was that, I mean, I've had a home in upstate New York for 30 some years. And although I've been a lifelong practicing artist, I never, up until about 10 years ago, thought of my environment as a source of um, inspiration for my work. So I was starting to do, again, a lot of learning trout fishing on the beautiful Lackawaxen that's actually right near the museum here, which is one of the spots that Zane Gray fished himself. And I, again, was arrested by the beauty of the fishing holes. Um, and it spoke to me so much, of course, of the Catskill and Hudson River regions. Um, Every view was a reference to a work of art. So again, I, 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 I gave up my hiking shoes. I put away my fishing pole and traded everything for the pursuit of painting outdoors, which I found really weds um, all of those things into one for me. But talk for a second about your um, background as an artist. Actually, I know you as a very early artist. That's right, that's right. Uh, uh, Karen and I actually went to high school together, and I remember Karen from uh, art class. <laughs> but uh, right. uh, but it, it uh, caught for you. It uh, um, I stayed away for it for another 40 mm. years. <laughs> but Karen, tell us about what, um, what your career was like. Let's see. Well, I mean, I really can remember as a kid that uh, discovering creativity. I mean, I, I frankly believe I can remember the moment when the act of creation really resonated with me. Yeah. Um, so in those days, one would live for an art class that might be every Friday, which seemed like an eternity for me. Um, the older I got, I mean, my parents would take me to like actually um, adult ed classes in downtown Detroit, where I could supplement, you know, the art education that I was getting in school, which was so regulated, as you would think. Um, so yeah, I kind of... coloring in the lines. Yeah. I mean, one resource for me, though, growing up in Detroit was the Detroit Art Institute, which has an incredible collection, which even to this day, I've, when I go back and visit, I'm still in awe of what is there. I mean, it's a great resource. So I you know, went um, to Wayne State University. I was a printmaking and painting major. Um, I gave myself a sabbatical, self-appointed sabbatical, and went to France for a year, which changed my life as well, too. I mean, I really went there to 
I had an, an interest in the French language, but also art history um, that I felt I would really, I mean, round out my education by, of course, going to Europe and seeing so much, you know, it's quite an important thing to do, in my opinion. So coming back, um, continued my studies at Wayne State in printmaking and painting again, and went into um, the field of, you know, to supplement my art, <laughs> or and lack of income, I actually started to work in a design studio that focused solely on typography. At that point in time, um, it was a very big deal for hot metal to become digitized. So I would have a studio by day or by night, and the other half of the day, I would do um, typography for, for advertising, which was kind of fun because at the end of the day, you would see it show up in a newspaper or, or what not. Um, from there, actually, curiously, um, went to London for a year and studied filmmaking. Wow. Well. Um, because I uh, go to the Detroit, um, was it the Detroit Film Theater at the Institute that has now become, I think, much bigger than it was at the time. And that was interesting because I would storyboarding, recording. I mean, I loved cinematography. We basically had to learn each of the roles. And it, it was formative for me, I think, in terms of my work because it, was, it would um, really require a story. When you're working pictorially, I mean, you, you may have a single visual statement, but I feel that this, on a, in another discipline, put, you know, um, thoughts in, into me in my mind when I was creating, and it actually had an impact. It was a turning point in my work, my own artwork, because I started working figuratively. A little background on that, too, I have to say, like at Wayne State, surprisingly, they had two years worth of um, anatomy and figure drawing, which I don't know why they did that, but I'm so grateful they did because they were all abstract expressionists. I mean, they were all in that period of rejection <laughs> of, of figurative um, work, which was sad, but I, I'm grateful for that because I considered myself kind of a closet figurative artist for a period until I, um, I guess, uh, gave myself permission to start working figuratively from my photographs quite often. And again, there was a period where I was working in pastels, still doing a lot, again, drawing and works on paper. Um, my printmaking... Uh, background gave me a real love of materials and surfaces and I made paper and pigments and just last year I took another materials course for art you know archival um, purposes again painting surfaces inks oils whatnot so I think that's really very important that one I mean for me was an inquisitive nature and wanting my work to survive, um, it doesn't take very long for things to deteriorate um, if you don't take care of them or, or pay attention to materials used. So I, um, again, coming back to New York, had gone from, from London. I actually went back to the Art Students League, which I have been in and out of for about the 30 years that I've been in New York. It's an old home for me to roam the halls there, like the worn marble steps that wind up the back, just thinking that George O'Keefe went up to this Studio 5 or whatever. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And I go in and out of, of the league um, for periods when I want to um, work figuratively as well. I was there again this last year too. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I have continued to study when I wanted to work 
in plein air. That started a whole period for me where I began to study the mastery of oil painting. I mean, this was all relatively new to me in that genre that I switched um, mm -hmm. materials. So the road to learning about landscape painting is not, I don't think, as linear as it is with figurative work because you really can't learn it per se. I mean, it's, you have to experience it. There's so much, I mean, again, it's almost like hiking and there's a survival aspect to it, like carrying your goods. I mean, it's physical work. It's, and, I, and did I you find, have, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm gonna interrupt you for a second and just ask mm -hmm. before we get too much more into the plein air, just, I don't wanna oh. lose your career. Um, oh, no. sort of theme too here that did you have other kinds of things that you were doing in your career that um, also were then related to art graphics those kinds of things yes I'm sorry I'm, I'm missing a major <laughs> bit of information there I was very lucky in New York to start working for magazines I mean from typography and advertising I, I was fortunate to work for magazines which is a group effort um, and uh, I was working for Rolling Stone initially, but came to spend a, a great deal of time, like over 25 years with Sports Illustrated, <laughs> which was very terrific. Um, again, it was an intense group, creative environment with everyone at the top of their game with respect you, to what they're contributing. What were you doing for them? I was, uh, well, I did two things. For a while, I was director of operations, actually, for Sports Illustrated for Kids. Um, that I attribute to, you know, my love of technology and translating, creating images digitally had a lot to do with my um, printmaking background. It's basically for color process printing, right? But only with the addition of photography and words and layout programs. So I got, I kind of sidestepped for quite a while um, into management and publishing systems. I mean, really very technical and managerial. And then I missed being creative. I mean, that, that satisfied me for quite a while. But I truly missed being a creator. So I um, did a lateral, had an opportunity to become an art director. And as deputy art director at Sports Illustrated, I focused for one five-year period as director of golf, which was really wonderful. I'm in a landscape again. Playing a game in a huge landscape <laughs> was quite phenomenal. I know a lot of people think, oh, golf is super boring. but spend time on the golf course. I mean, we covered like the masters. I mean, every major golf, golf tournament. I mean, I look forward every year to the Augusta coverage and what was new on the courses. I mean, I love of landscape flowers, trees, which we all study, um, were embedded in that experience. And I went to a number of Olympic games and was on site in the media centers. And it was, Work under pressure, extremely interesting, on a deadline, and um, overall, really a very enjoyable experience. That's great. And so you went from uh, uh, doing that, and that now you've moved into plein air uh, an awful lot of your time, I know. Are you, um, you and now you've decided to create, I guess a year ago, you decided to create a event for plein air what what is your event yes um well the event that i wanted to craft here really has its roots in the upper delaware river region which is the the poconos the lower catskills right and the location here that inspired me to was zane gray's home which i'd been here as a visitor, you know, years in and out. And I always had a great feeling for the place here because of the vision that he had 
can, can you just in, introduce who Zane Gray is? I, I'm guessing uh, there's an awful lot of people that have no sense of who he is. Uh, okay. I think most people are very familiar with a book that he wrote called Writers of the Purple Sage. Mm -hmm. um, Zane was one of the original, I mean, he really is given credit for the, creating the adventure genre. Um, I mean, he's a Hemingway-esque character, in my mind, very in love with the outdoors, deep I think sea fishermen. I think Sorry? Of, I think of him as cowboy, as the books and things is yes. related to cowboys and being out west and yes. riding yes. horses into the sunset. Right. He, he was a very colorful character. And... So, I mean, they were here for a period of like 20 years, but Zane was deep sea fishing off Catalina and in the Keys and Mexico. He very much, he has a very nice collection here of Native American artifacts and was a proponent of Native Americans. Um, so I think he's really a very important figure. Um, you know, I, and I don't know that he gets, I mean, he was very successful in his time. But I think today, um, it, it's nice to revisit, I'd say, what his contributions were. I mean, he founded, um, a number of his books were developed as screenplays and became early westerns. Um, forgive me, I'm forgetting the name of his um, film company, but he started a, a studio in Hollywood and he was phenomenally successful and had a real vision, I would say. And as we're talking, like his next act, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he morphed along and everything built, but really tied together thematically and expressed his love for, you know, for Native peoples. Um, and the environment, um, that's where I feel like I tie in my love of the environment um, with plein air painting. Um, I've been also involved in some environmental causes um, for to protect overdevelopment of public waterfront, actually in Hoboken. So there are many, many issues that face um, the Delaware River to preserve its pristine quality too. So these things are a wonderful way. I mean, the, the practice of plein air is very much related in my mind to environmental, you know, well-being. I mean, it's very, very much akin to the Hudson River school painters who, who also recognize this. It's, a, it's, it's really the same thing. I'm, yeah, I really share that and found um, as I have said to you, um, I have a show going on right now about bees and beekeepers, but it really mm -hmm. is out of, it, it's really two things. It's one of a, a care about the environment, but also in terms of as a painter, I have to say that those paintings in my own mind are some of my best ones. And I think it's cool yes. because of the care for that. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think when we were talking earlier, we were mentioning that about your passion when you're working on something that you have a tangential passion to that, like we were saying too, it may not produce the best work, but it's something that keeps you pursuing your best. Absolutely. And yeah. pushing it. It's a, a lifetime. Yeah, I well, love your BC. Tell people. us a little bit about your event. Oh, okay. Um, this is the second year. Um, I, I brought the idea... Um, to the directors here last year, and they and they loved the concept because they felt um, that it was in keeping with Zane's vision for <clears throat> the home. And last year, we had a small number of people that came up um, from Mapapa that I'm also a member of. Um, that from um, Mid Atlantic Plein Air Painters okay. Association. Yeah, we had people from Maryland and Virginia and DC come up. Uh, regrettably, I had no one local, um, you know, but I said, okay, I've learned some lessons. I'm going to start advertising, you know, 
earlier next year. Um, I don't take any of these things as a setback at all. It's like these things take time to build. So yeah. I, um, I also volunteer in my second year. Um, I have my now good friend Lillian Ainsley, who founded the Olmsted Plein Air Invitational. It's a, a huge, huge event, and she's just done a phenomenal and job where is that? with it. Oh, that's in Atlanta. Huh? Again, again, it's um, the Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted, right, who designed Central Park and had a hand in Belle Isle in Detroit. I mean, these, these linkages are very significant to me. Yeah, um, in, in Atlanta, um, they, they spend each year a portion of the week dedicated to painting in various sections of Olmsted Park that was saved from becoming a rail a rail line or something awful. You know, I mean, what they've done with the park too is um, is phenomenal. So I, I learn a tremendous amount by being with Lillian, working for her, and. Um, I actually, Lillian is, will be up here this summer. Um, we have more people actually coming this year now from yes. out of out of state to the event, and it's it's an invitational. This is not a competition. Um, people can come up for either two to three days and paint on the grounds of the museum here on the Delaware River, um, and we actually are within walking distance of other historic landmarks. Um, for one, the Roebling Bridge, which I don't know that you can see in the background here, um, there's a sketch, I have failed to mention Dolly in all of this, um, who was Zane's wife, um, business manager, um, but a, <laughs> a very accomplished artist. I mean, her lovely watercolors are here and her plein air sketches that literally record what you would see if you went out the front door and looked eastward at the Roebling Bridge. So um, as part of our event um, this weekend, prior to our, our weekend in August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. those days. Okay, August um, 3rd and 4th for yeah. your event. Right, right. Um, and this event that you're talking about for this weekend so this, the, um, 13th and 14th? Well, this weekend, it's a one day. Um, mm -hmm. There's an organization called the Zane Gray West Society, mm -hmm. and they have hosted this event annually here, and it's a very, very big deal. The local uh, fire departments come, there are horses, mm -hmm. they bring in life-size eagle nests for the children to sit in and get a sense of them. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a nexus of um, community interests and uh, that, that that participate annually here. I would say so. I was very fortunate to be invited to come this year. I'm very excited, and I thought to involve the community and rather than explain what plein air is, it would be much more fun to to develop something that we could do hands-on and I, my assumption is that people have zero zero background in this and they want to be able to involve kids as well too so we'll be doing um just some little fun with looking at dolly's sketches and i've got material sketchboards basically pencils i've got some landscape viewfinders for them to go out and capture their little slice of the landscape and then do, you know, kind of very um, impressionistic gestural or drawings. Nice. Um, so we'll be doing that. And I may or may not get to painting, you know, depending on but you the might number. Do a There's a, you might do a demonstration. If yeah, I'm going to have a setup, you know, for oils and all my tools, and we'll see um, as, as the day flows if I have periods where I can actually do some painting. I'd love to do that. And let's talk about your event just a little bit more. It's So you have um, people coming from these different states. It's not, uh, it's an invitational, it's uh, not a competition. Uh, what else do you hope for it? Well, this year... I'm hoping, well, certainly 
I have a lot of people who are interested to come that are local this year, which is great. Um, I've had a couple other feeder events, too, I should say. I devised a pop-up uh, plein air painting event for the first day of trout season. Um, I also spoke with a group who has a heritage garden in Narrowsburg to do morning workshops um, for Saturday mornings in July. So <clears throat> my goal is still <clears throat> to develop, you know, a following and more community involvement um, for people who want to learn or, or practicing artists. And, and how would people get to know about this, uh, people watching this, if they want to uh, get out to uh, out to see you? Oh, well, I guess um, email me. Um, it's pretty easy. Info at zanegrayplanair.com. Right. And then I'll be happy to send you the lovely um, write-up on what's happening. I mean, we have some people who want to camp we have glamping. Uh, this year I actually went out and found some lodging for people so we could have a bit of after hours events, you know, each evening after painting, some great dinners. Um, we're gonna have like a local product, like meet and greet um, party, like kickoff party Friday night. Um, but I've got lodging booked. And one, one home is formerly a mill. The other um, is kind of, um, a lug I'll call it a rustic chic home that is adjacent to a little trout stream. And they are actually offering glamping if anybody wants to be out outdoors for the entire weekend. I I'd like to do that <laughs> myself. What? It looks really fun. So, so um, you know, just to... Uh, move a little bit uh, in a little different direction. It sounds like you're going to have a great event. Um, it's it's August 34th and maybe the 2nd if people want to come early. And and so what's next for you personally as an artist? More painting this year. Um, I recently have kind of flipped my schedule and have been spending more time upstate for painting. Um, I really want to develop a, a body of work in a, in a new direction that I'm going. Um, I know I think we talked about influences on my work and um, you know the process of becoming a, a landscape painter. Mm -hmm. um, I. I really narrowed it down to um, ver various workshops during the year. Um, I, I just did another one, you know, with, with I'm sorry, with repeating people. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, you know, I'll call it a directed study, but it, it is that in a sense. Um, you know, and the workshop that I just came back from was in Concord. Massachusetts with Victor Budko, who's a, a Russian <clears throat> impressionist painter, excuse me. Um, and he has a very, very wonderful style that is very economical, very lively brush strokes. And I have really enjoyed um, getting together, I would say, seasonally, annually, you know, at least once or twice, with a couple different people. <clears throat> so I feel there's a continuity and a development that I feel in my work. Um, I did do, for the first time, some snow painting, mm -hmm. you know, I guess extreme painting, if you want to call it that. And again, coming from Michigan, I found that I thrive again when I'm in, in the elements and challenged by the cold, you have to learn, again, some survival techniques with it because standing still in the cold isn't fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, can and uh, do you have one uh, survival technique? Yes. Canadian boots. Ah, okay. <laughs> if, any, if anyone knows how to, you know, cope with the cold, it's Canadians. I, I told this to someone recently. 
I mean, that, that really was it for me. I mean, because you get, I think, cold from your feet up. Yeah. Your yeah. extremities, right? So if, you're, if, you're, if your trunk is warm and your feet are warm. Um, and your hands, yeah. Yeah, my hands really didn't bother me at all. But I don't know if it was because I was excited and I'm at work and I'm ignoring. I mean, day to day, of course, there are extreme changes. You can have beautiful sun following a nor'easter. <laughs> like we had but um i like in those those times to really be a challenge that you're kind of preparing for mentally and physically and you you see how you do but again where i went um the my second outing was in jeffersonville vermont which is a very famous location for american impressions the painting year round, but and very notably for the winter scenes. So that's another skill within the plein air skill yeah. set is that that type of painting, very different. And um, so you, you just learn so much by being with people again in different environments. That's great. That's great. So. So Karen, um, I'm feeling that we uh, um, probably will uh, wrap up here. Is there mm -hmm. anything else that you would like to just uh, leave with uh, our, our viewers? Well, I guess again, I'd love to invite people to come out and see us. Uh, I think we, we've got a few weeks here. We'd love to have you out. Um, it's a very lovely area. Uh, it should be a really lovely weekend with, with some surprise guests. We've got people, again, like I say, coming up from artists from uh, the Olmsted event. And it'll be an event of mixed levels for people. People who are not experienced should feel comfortable coming to enjoy. So well, That's great. Well, thank Come you up. so much for uh, uh, spending time today and catching up and your event sounds wonderful. I hope we do get some people that might want to come east um, and spend some time mm -hmm. with you and, uh, and to paint. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Mary. All right. Talk to you again. Okay, great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.